Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I'm very proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2022-2023 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through grants from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Since 2016, the Foundations of Biomedical Data Science the seminar series is focused on the use of data science methodologies, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and statistical modeling as they pertain to different themes within the biomedical and health sciences. This year's theme is data science and the public health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, where each Friday we will enjoy presentations from leading thinkers about the issues, promises, opportunities, and hurdles associated with understanding the secondary health effects of COVID-19. These include delayed health checkups, treatments, mental health, drug abuse, increased obesity, and the long lingering health effects associated with the SARS COVID-19 virus. Indeed, our 2022-2023 application cycle has just been extended to Jan uh, January 31st. And so we encourage junior faculty members who are working in areas such as infectious diseases, epidemiology, clinical medicine, population health, as well as data science, machine learning, AI, statistics, and other relevant domains to consider applying. We believe this is an exciting and engaging program which characterizing the secondary health effects of COVID-19 necessitates unique quantitative approaches, but also new multidisciplinary collaborations. Participants selected for the Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage the presentations like you're going to hear today as vital material in their culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held at the Lodge at St. Edwards Park in Seattle, Washington in June of 2023. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Navid Gafarzagdigan, Associate Professor at the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Virginia Tech. Navid earned his PhD in public policy and uh, working in systems dynamics from the State University of New York at Albany in 2011. He holds a Master's of Business Administration and Management from Sharif University of Technology, Mechanical Engineering, also from Sharif University. And prior to joining Virginia Tech, he was a postdoctoral researcher at MIT in the Environmental Systems or Engineering Systems Division, excuse me. Naveed's research interests include systems level thinking and systems dynamics modeling of complex social systems with applications in health policy. His work includes modeling the spread of infectious diseases, and his COVID-19 related research papers have appeared in various journals such as The Lancet, Bio, Bioscience, PLOS Computational Biology, and he has received um, considerable media attention by The Washington Post, The New York Times, The BBC, and Le Monde. His research has been supported by several federal organizations, such as the NIH, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation. Fun fact about Naveed is he enjoys watching soccer and is a fan of Persepolis uh, Football Club and Team Melly, and he ran his first half marathon at the age of 44. So there is hope for us all. So thank you, Naveed. And continuing with the 2022-2023 Biomedical Data Science uh, uh, Seminar a series theme, Naveed's lecture today is entitled Enhancing Long-Term Forecasting, Learning from COVID-19 Models. And he is going to describe for us that while much of the effort has gone into building predictive models um, of the COVID-19 pandemic, some have argued that early exponential growth combined with st the, st the stochastic nature of epidemics makes long-term prediction of contagion trajectories next to impossible. And he is gonna demonstrate two complementary studies to assess model features which support better long-term predictions. He's gonna describe um, how he leverages diverse models contributing to um, uh, the CDC repository of COVID-19 and US, USA death projections to identify factors associated with um, increasing the predictability and accuracy across different projection horizons. He's then going to introduce a very simple model which incorporates these features and offers informative predictions as far as 20 weeks ahead with accuracy comparable to the best models in the CDC data set. And he is going to argue that long-term predictive power of multi wave COVID-19 trajectories is capturing behavioral responses, balancing feedbacks where perceived risk and death uh, continuously changes transmission rates throughout the adoption and relaxation of various non-pharmaceutical interventions. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 22 
2022-2023 Biomedical Science Innovation Lab participants and alumni are encouraged to submit any questions via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, Naveed. We are very much looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be in this group and uh, present this work. Uh, so this work is about um, pandemic forecasting and it is a collaborative work. My co-authors uh, are Haji Rahman Dad from MIT and Ran Shu from University of Connecticut. And our works have been recently funded by the NSF and in Division of Mathematical Sciences and Social and Economic Sciences. So we have been all dealing with the problem of COVID-19 and we can easily remember how things have evolved in the past three years. There have been many puzzling questions and um, research has been done, you know, different research projects to uncover those. And some of the kind of questions that quickly comes to our mind are about um, estimation of cases that we have in terms of COVID-19, estimating how many people have died, you know, providing more accurate um, estimations. Then another layer of questions are about policies, how what policies help to um, better contain the disease. And these policy questions comes up at the government level, at organizations level. You know, many of you in universities, uh, probably your universities have been thinking about how to help um, keep students safe. Or even at individuals, you know, many of us have been thinking what type of actions help to keep our family safer. And then other questions about scenarios, things that are exogenous and may influence the spread of a disease, such as changing the weather. But one other, another question, which is related to the other ones, is about forecasting. Can we offer a better short-term and long-term forecasting of the spread of the disease? And this is the main focus of this presentation, but it is also related to the other questions too. Why do we care about forecasting? Actually, forecasting has been always one of the concerns that we have had for making better decisions in our society. Just when you can forecast about things that are going to happen for your organization, for your country, you can be more proactive. So there is a strong reason that forecasting matters makes you smarter. In terms of pandemic, it is unavoidable. You know, we have to forecast, you know, we we have emergency measures in place, we, we want to make a better plan about resource allocations and make a more efficient allocation of resources. So we want to know how the how the pandemic will look like a few months ahead and, and, and be prepared for that. In terms of hospital capacity, we like to be prepared for that. But even at the individual level, you know, wedding plans or you know, attending conferences in person or online, these are things that come up and they are connected to forecasting. So whether or not you are developing a formal model for forecasting, you, at the end, you, know, you, you have to predict or um, kind of have some kind of hand, you know, expectations about how the disease will uh, go on to make better decisions. And if you don't have models, many times we end up using our own mental models, our best guesses about how the future will evolve. But there are several problems about pandemic forecasting. And, uh, you know, just looking back, it feels like, you know, um, we had models that uh, predicted um, cases that were far from reality and far from things that emerged. You know, we had at, in, the, in two extreme con uh, conditions, too. I mean, we had models that predicted that there will be millions of deaths in just a few months, just at the beginning of the pandemic. And there were also models that predicted that by May 2020, everything will end and we'll be back to normal life. And none of these happened. So apparently pandemic forecasting was very difficult. As a result, some of these scholars have suggested that just this is probably impossible or very hard to do. It is because of all these, it's not necessarily because of lack of data, but it's just the nature of, um, exponential growth that you see in these situations with a little bit um, deviation at the beginning, you end up with a different trajectory. So maybe that's the reason that <clears throat> it's hard to do. We ask a little bit different questions that, you know, if we can just look at a sample of models about COVID-19 and explore which ones are doing better and what model features makes them better models, maybe we can 
bring insight into better, developing better forecasting models. Maybe we can have better models, better use of data to provide a better long-term pandemic. Many of you are aware of this uh, fundamental building block of many um, um, epidemic models, which is SEIR model. It goes back to 100 years ago. And the basic logic is that when you want to model the spread of the disease, you um, divide the population to specific groups, susceptibles, exposed, infected, and then removed. And then you have uh, different feedback loops, but especially the one that infected individuals result in more exposure. And then with this positive feedback loop, you end up um, having a, you know, more and more spread of the disease. And then, you know, at some point you uh, run out of susceptibles and then that's where we, um, we, uh, we finish, we are finished with it, uh, with the epidemic. But when you simulate these models, you usually have uh, two different modes of behavior. One of them is exponential growth and then saturation is like an S-shaped curve, um, you know, obviously with different slopes, but the, the the figure look um, very similar, at least qualitatively. The other mode is that you know the, pan the pandemic doesn't emerge, and at the beginning, with a you know R naught of um, less than one, you just never um, have rising cases. So there are two different modes of behavior. If you look at active cases, you see one um, kind of um, bump in number of cases, and then it goes down, and uh, we are done. There are several uh, extensions to this model, obviously, in the past 100 years. And these extensions are in different directions, especially in, in increasing the number of compartments and those kind of uh, boxes that you see in the picture. You know, what if we divide our infected to asymptomatic versus symptomatic? You know, what if we um, add you know, another uh, stock variable for people who are in hospital and so on? So there are different directions. Um, but there are also limitations to these models, you know, and uh, people have been dealing with that. So these are the common behaviors that you see on the left hand. And then the, if you look at the data, the data looks like looks differently. This is data from the United States. Uh, and as you see until you know, October 2021, it is not just one uh, you know, bell shaped curve in terms of cases, but you see oscillation, oscillation in cases oscillation in confirmed uh, cases, oscillation in confirmed death, and even not a constant test coverage. Number of people that are tested are, diff are changing over time, and that also influences how many confirmed cases you have. So not a regular S-shaped curve, not a bell-shaped curve, oscillatory patterns in data, and change in observations over time. This is not just US. You look at all around the world and you see different sorts of behavior. Again, you know, oscillation exists in uh, many parts of the world, but, you know, with different frequency or period of the oscillation and different magnitude of oscillations. All these uh, graphs are normalized to the population so you can actually compare uh, the y-axis to, and as you see, you know, in, in, in uh, Peru and Chile, we have uh, big numbers for daily cases and death. Then, you know, we end up uh, with South Korea and New Zealand with lower number of cases per uh, million of population. So you have a range of behaviors and it is a little bit too much to expect from uh, SEIR models to predict and, and produce all these ranges of behavior. So what can be done to have a better model or to have a better forecast? This is our study design. So we take advantage of this data set that exists in CDC. So CDC uh, in April 2020, so early in the pandemic, created this fantastic forecast hub, which many modelers submitted their projections in that hub and on a weekly basis. So every week, um, very experienced modelers, very good teams were submitting their projections, their model-based projections about how many cases or how many deaths we will have in the next weeks on a weekly basis. So you would predict, pre predict next week death, two weeks later death, three weeks later death, so some time horizon, and you would submit to this forecast up. So there is this huge data set there based on how uh, models have been forecasting. And we focused on models that forecast uh, death. There were 61 models 
that they were providing forecasts. And it is not just national level, actually many of them were uh, for specific locations and 57 kind of specific locations in the US, you can recognize that there were projections for them on a weekly basis. And we picked uh, this one year period, which uh, was around the time that we started this uh, research. And, the, and these models, you know, some of them were forecasting like uh, one to four weeks ahead, and some of them were providing a longer term forecasting, which was interesting. So you are dealing with a huge number of data points in terms of forecasts, about half a million uh, data points that are coming from these 60 models for, very, for a big sample of regions, not just one sample. And over a year, so it's not just one uh, bumping number of cases, but uh, capturing the oscillation. So there is this data. And we thought that, okay, we can start by studying the approaches of, uh, that these modelers have used in their models, look at their reports, look at the articles that are coming out of this, and analyze if there is association between model architecture, assumptions that exist in the model, approaches that these modelers have taken, and then accuracy of the forecast. You know, remember that that half a million data points that we have, time has passed, and we actually have now the correct value of depth. So we can calculate the error in those predictions and see if there is any association between model architecture of these 60 models and how accurate they have been in their forecast. And then if we can extract the main insights and build a simple model, we can kind of compare and validate that model using uh, this analysis. Model categories that we recognize early on by looking at these were these four big groups. You may have mechanistic compartmental model. It's very similar to the slide that you saw at the beginning. So it follows the logic of using compartments, stocks for how people are divided into a different population. You often use differential equation to formulate those models. Another category is non-mechanistic models, which has been growing, especially recently, with machine learning techniques, regression techniques. So the idea is that you're not simulating the mechanics of how the disease spreads. Many times you have a black box model that has inputs and outputs. So the goal is to be, have a better prediction of, from, uh, for those outputs and, and, and improve your model over time. You have a third category, which is ensemble models. Many modelers have multiple models and which can be mechanistic or non-mechanistic. And just they combine the results, either they look at the mean of, uh, forecast or median of forecast and use that as the output of their forecasting. So technically ensemble models are also um, kind of combination of mechanistic and non-mechanistic models. You have a fourth category, others, and we were hoping to see more agent-based models there, but it turned out that there were only two agent-based models and they didn't continue projecting. I'm assuming that that's because of the high computational expense of these type of models. In simple words, it takes time to project. And if you want to submit your projections on a weekly base, probably it's not that feasible. <clears throat> we went through all the documents that exist in these uh, models and not all models are well documented. So there is a variation in terms of how documents are provided, but we looked for what are the variables that you are considering their model? What are their uh, approaches for using data in their model. Is the data an input to the model or is it used for model calibration and compare, you know, fixing model with the data? <clears throat> and what are the outputs of these models? Are they projecting death cases? And into what time horizon they are considering their forecast? One important question was that how transmission intensity or reproduction number is modeled here, you know, sometimes People use simplistic assumptions and deal with a constant number, but sometimes you have a more advanced um, approach and try to model it explicitly or implicitly in the model and try to kind of um, predict how transmission is going to change over time, especially for the future transmission. It becomes important that are, you, are we assuming that from now on, the disease will have the same reproduction number or is going to change as people's behavior changes? Finally, stage resetting is, is the idea that um, 
how they are dealing with errors in their estimations and in their calibrations. There are advanced methods like common filtering that you try to filter for all the noises that you have in your um, in your simulation to have better estimations of your parameters. So how advanced are these um, calibration methods? In terms of mobility, there was uh, this interesting trend in, in, uh, in models that um, many try to actually include that as inputs to their model. So it is a representation of human behavior. So how that was done in the model, that was a question that we dealt with. You know, are they modeling how people change their mobility or we are using data and data goes as an input to the model rather than having, a, having mobility as a function of other state variables. In addition, you know, we gathered data about modelers affiliation, their disciplinary and where they are coming, you know, is it from industry or um, academia and the availability of technical documents and so on. We looked at other factors specifically in each group of modeling, for example, in mechanistic models that have, you know, the ones that had enough documentation, you can look at the, the the level to which these models are, are you know, provide a detailed representation of the spread of the disease. Is that just three state variable of SIR or SEIR, or it is way more detailed? Are they like age structures are included in those models or no, they are all considered um, kind of an average in aggregate. And, you know, are they considering weather impact in their uh, mechanistic models? Similar questions were raised about non-mechanistic models. You know, what is the approach again? Is that a regression model? Is that a machine learning model? And the same, you know, do they consider weather impact? And ensemble models, you know, which type of uh, models they have included. So these are all coding. So for this coding, it is more like a qualitative work that you go through all the documents and analyze it and see how um, they have done the job. And the quantitative part was about analyzing the forecast um, errors and kind of um, finding, you know, how the errors are emerging and then finding associations between what you are seeing in the model structure and the amount of error that they have had in their projections. Our first round of results is just analysis of these, these models. First, let's look at the distribution of the models. This is how you see in different categories. Mechanistic models are kind of the majority of the models that we see in this uh, in this sample. Non-mechanistic models were actually producing, you know, a kind of a, a considerable fraction of the models. About thirty-eight percent of the models were non-mechanistic, and ensemble models around like twelve percent uh, of the models were ensemble models. Under the category of mechanistic models, you can divide the models into uh, different uh, groups. We divided them to compartmental with stage resetting and without stage resetting and agent-based models. So agent-based models are at individual. And as I said, there were only two models in that category and they didn't continue projecting after a while. But in compartmental models, we had models that had more sophisticated methods of dealing with noise in data and trying to kind of filter for those noise and the ones that kind of took a more simplistic approach. So these are categories of models that we observed after coding the data. Then we plot the error that we see in their projections. The um, X axis here is prediction horizon. So week one is the error that you're producing when you are projecting next week um, death. Week two is amount of error that you're producing when you're projecting week two. And uh, y-axis here is the relative error. So it's not absolute error, but we are comparing the error that each of the category of these models have with a constant model. So that's our baseline. And constant model was is the simplest model that you can have as a naive model. It, uh, the assumption in a constant model is that whatever death is today, death of COVID is today, that's going to continue for 14 weeks. So we are not changing the numbers. We are just going with whatever today is. So that's the simplest model that you can have. And we pick that and compare the errors that you get from each of these categories with that constant model. Let's just focus on red line and blue line. Uh, the red line 
is those non-mechanistic models like regression models, machine learning models. And the blue line are those compartmental models that are differential equations like SEIR models, but with no stage resetting. As you see, in short term, red line is doing better, lower error, but in long term, blue line is doing better. So it appears that care fitting approaches in the red line are good at providing short term predictions, but probably they are overfitting. And in long term, we are getting um, lots of error in our projections. In contrast, the blue line was doing bad in short term, but in long term, because it was probably capturing the mechanics of the spread of the disease, it had limited um, kind of future projections and was providing some more insights about future projections. But what was better than all of these were compartmental models that had a stage resetting too. So either that's about stage resetting, so the benefits of dealing with noises in data and kind of trying to filter them, or just people who were doing these type of filtering techniques, they were actually better modelers and their models ended up having lower errors uh, over the long range too. These are average of errors that you get from each of these categories. So we did lots of regression analysis and, and all these uh, results and insights are robust. And, um, and a few other, other things that you, know, you would find is that, um, well, not <laughs> no, academic models are barely better, if at all, from non-academic models. And you know, there are like a few things, for example, you know, that constant model wasn't doing that bad you know, when you compare with some of these groups. And there's a reason for that. I will discuss why in long term you're, you're getting some benefits from that naive assumption that you'll have the same level of death in the future. But these are the first layer of results that you get from this analysis. And if I want to list a few other insights that I, we got after kind of analyzing all these models in, at the individual level is that first, in long-term projections, mechanic, mechanistic models were performing better than non-mechanistic models or care-fitting models. So that was obvious in the previous graph. The second point was that the models that captured transmission rate, they did a better forecast, you know, change in transmission rate. So models that are modeling or considering the fact that reproduction number or the speed of uh, spread of the disease may change in the future as human behavior changes, they are doing a better job in their forecast. The ones that are assuming whatever the uh, transmission rate is today, that's how things will evolve in the future. This is how the virus is behaving they are doing a, a worse uh, projection in the future. So that was one of the interesting things that we found. One of these models were actually endogenously modeling transmission rate. The logic was simple. The modelers were assuming that if death rate per million you know, passes some threshold, the government is going to have more lockdown measures or similar measures, which will decrease transmission rate. So they had built this assumption for their future projection. As they were projecting, they had this mechanism in their model that if death rate is going to increase in this model, there will be some intervention by government in the future to decrease that by decreasing transmission. This is endogenously modeling um, <clears throat> transmission rate. A few good models included weather impact and state resetting looks like helpful based on the past graph. <clears throat> so the question is that, um, so these are associations, right? Like how good really they are? Can we do a little experiment and see, you know, kind of, you know, control things and see, are they really improving in the um, benefits that you get from forecasts? So let's just build the simplest model that you can have and only include these uh, four features and see if that model does any better. So we start with, the simplest possible model is SEIR, and we add a behavioral feedback loop to that, which captures endogenous change in transmission rate. If cases and death increases, we are assuming that people's risk perception will increase, and that means that they will involve, they will do uh, some kind of measures, they will, they will involve in some uh, preventive measures that will decrease transmission in the future. And as death declines, they will feel more relaxed and they will go more outside, which can increase the transmission rate. The stage resetting is simple. I will uh, talk about that. And impact of bitter is, was a published paper by our team. 
and we just um, included that effect, uh, marginal effect on our projection to uh, see how, how much that really helps. And you exclude many other important factors that one should not exclude when they are doing a forecasting job. And the reason is that we want to keep this as simple as possible and look at those features. Things that are excluded are like testing or travel or even asymptomatic versus symptomatic, you know, vaccination rate and all those things changing uh, IFR, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, hospitals are learning and improving their operations and kind of decreasing death rate or adherence fatigue, you know, you see that, you know, people are getting tired of COVID and they want to go out. That's also important. So we exclude all these things. In the estimation side, we go with the most simple assumptions. You know, we, for example, you know, many parameters, we don't estimate them, we just get them from papers. So to decrease the um, degrees of freedom that this model have and focus on things that we really care in terms of those, you know, mechanisms that you're exploring. This is a simple SEIR model, as you saw in the previous slide. So if you want to sh uh, show it in a diagram, what we have done to this model is this. So we are adding one feedback. So re the rate at which people are removing from infected individuals to, uh, to remove, a fraction of them are dying. And you can calculate that by infection fatality rate. You get number of deaths. So we want to represent that if that death increases, people will have some risk response. Their perception of risk increases. That decreases their activities and contact rate, which will decrease transmission intensity, right? So for that mechanism, we just take death. We calculate lag death. So that's delayed death. And if that's increasing based on the equation that you see there, it's, it, if that increases inversely, affects transmission rate, which means that it decreases that. So this is the, uh, the main equation that we add to that kind of conventional SEIR model. Um, so we have a few parameters that now we want to um, um, calibrate and estimate them in this uh, analysis. So they would be uh, beta naught, you know, the, the initial um, uh, transmission intensity, patient zero, in turn, you know, arrival to the system, you know, when is the disease is going to start in this uh, region and, uh, and other uh, factors, you know, like um, time that it takes for people to adjust their risk perception. So that lag to death, what is the delay for that, which can be different for different societies. In terms of state resetting, again, you know, we try to be very simple. There are more advanced techniques and, and we didn't do that. So we went with a very heuristic uh, and, and, and cheap in terms of computation um, that, you know, when we are projecting uh, a trend at the time of projection, we are considering, you know, the error at the date of projection, you know, whatever death today is, you know, if our model is uh, predicting a little bit less or a little bit high, we try to um, correct for that error, but then the rest of the simulation goes as it was um, working. Let's look at the performance of this simple model. So remember that all these 61 models in, in the COVID hub, they are very advanced and very good quality models. Many of them are high quality models and are developed by a very good modelers. So there are so many kind of interesting features and so many achievements there. Uh, what we wanna do here is just to look at like how this model uh, is, um, that is learning from those models and capturing the essential kind of useful mechanisms that those have. Uh, can it really kind of in performance also show a performance that is comparable? When we project, uh, so we use uh, past, you know, that duration of time in our projection. So we use like past data and then project and, and then, you know, in the same time, we can also calculate the error that we have in our projection because things have happened, right? So at the time of projection, we are not using any future data, but we start projecting and then we calculate the error. So what would have been our error if this was our projections? So we do that for 57 regions in the United States. And in this picture adds up all the projections so in the first glance, it, it looks like the simple model can create oscillation in data. It's not perfect. There are places that, you know, in those red circles show time of projections. Again, just examples. So we can create 
oscillations with this. And sometimes, you know, it's kind of error is bigger than expected, but overall you see the patterns. <clears throat> then we calculate errors on projection horizon. So we have done all these uh, projections with the model for different regions. Let's just add up all errors per capita and compare the performance that you would get from this model with other models. And the model that is hard to beat is COVID, uh, CDC's COVID hub um, ensemble uh, projection. So a fascinating thing about uh, CDC's COVID hub is that um, if, you, if you get all this data and look at the median of, um, of projections, you actually get a pretty good prediction. And that's the blue line here. So it appears that the simple model can do a better job than hard, hard to beat ensemble model in this, uh, in this group of models, which was very interesting. So when we saw that this model does a pretty good job in terms of projection and the error is lower, then we started um, turning off all these features and see which one is actually helping us. So first we turned off the effect of weather. Is that helping us? That's marginally helping us. And as you see, there is a, uh, there is a, there is a graph that is, you know, has a higher error, still better than the ensemble model, but, um, but you know, adding better effect is marginally helping us. State resetting was helping in short-term forecast, but not in long-term forecast. So that's kind of taking care of the early errors. <clears throat> but what was the most benefit, uh, beneficial feature of this model was that feedback loop. So the worst uh, case here that you see with the line and star on it is our model when you turn off the uh, response, the behavioral response in that, and you suddenly get a huge error worse than uh, most models in, um, worse than the ensemble model. <clears throat> so apparently that feedback is what is mainly making this work a, a, a good predictor. Then we compared the projection of this model, which each individual models that you have in this uh, group of models, you have, um, you know, we, have, we started with 61 models, not all of them are projecting uh, on, a, on a kind of regular basis. So with this, if you rank them based on the error that you're creating, you end up with this graph. And our model is uh, the black line that is bold. And you see that during the first four weeks, we are among the top 10. But then after a while, it, it moves uh, higher and um, provides, you know, as, as the second um, in projection. The, the one that is uh, constantly higher is a very good model, has, you know, capturing many uh, details, many interesting details about the spread of the disease. It's computationally way more advanced and has much more detail. But importantly, that's the one that has the feedback. So it's the one that was assuming that if in projection, projecting death, number of death passes some threshold in the future, again, there will be some interventions from the government. So that's the model that actually is doing a great job in this set. Use all other measures, again, to compute our model with, uh, with these models. And um, this is error that each model is creating in comparison to the constant model that I said at the beginning that, you know, assumes um, Death is, is constant. You see that you know there are several models that are doing better than that model, and um, and um, but you know that model is not also a necessarily a bad model. <clears throat> and and I will mention the the reason that that's uh, doing um, an interesting performance. So the point here is that mechanistic models, you know, uh, when you narrow down to uh, more kind of important structures and avoid overfitting, it helps you. Simple model is helping here. So this is the lesson that we are learning from this analysis. And what is important in expanding SCR models is the feedback loop, not necessarily the compartments. So most focus is around increasing the compartments, increasing the details in, in compartmental models. However, many times you get the most benefit by including behavioral feedback, how people are responding to change in the state variables. And that suddenly gives you, um, kind of improves your models. And, you know, we, we learned other things in this analysis, like how uh, you can get wrong conclusion if you just 
focus on one region, projecting one region, or projecting at one time period, or projecting only for one um, one wave of the disease. These are these you know, from data analysis perspective. It is very important to have a big sample of regions, to have a long sample of um, of uh, data points in terms of like different waves of the disease. You know, sometimes you're good at in one wave, but not in the other one. So we should all expand these data source, data um, extension, and that will help you to have, uh, to really help, you know, what makes a model a better model. <clears throat> so let me just get back to the model. This was the simplest model that you can have, you know, kind of conventional model. This is what we add. This is the behavioral response that you are adding to this model, making that data endogenous. So how important this model is? I just focused on forecasting, but it appears that this behavioral feedback has many more benefits. It's not just forecasting. It can help you in, in, in many directions, and it can pro provide unique insights about several puzzles that have, have been dealing during the pandemic. And I want to kind of briefly mention that they are all documented in this commentary in, um, in BMJ uh, Global Health. So if we call that feedback loop a risk-driven response, so the assumption is that as death increases, people perceive higher risk and they respond and that uh, changes the spread of the disease. If you include that, it can explain several puzzles. One of them is convergence of reproduction number to one. So this is one of the interesting observations that some of us had. Uh, when you look at um, the data points of the spread of the disease across different nations, across different regions, one of the interesting thing and challenging thing is that you see that these REs are all around one, you know, just uh, ignoring the first uh, few months of the pandemic, which was at the beginning and R0 was high and the disease was spreading. After a while, R is converging uh, around one. And many people actually misinterpreted that as herd immunity early on. You know, we are, we, are, we are finishing with the disease, but that wasn't the case. There was this convergence to one. And the question was why this is happening. And it is not just the average R. You know, if you look at countries, each uh, kind of when we looked at that, like about 140 countries, their average remained between 0.9 and 1.1. So it is not changing that much. Why is that happening? You know, why RE converged to one? Why that equilibrium emerged? So that can be explained by this feedback. Remember that when RE reproduction number is above one, that means that the spread of the disease continues to increase, right? So if the number of cases are increasing and that corresponds to increasing number of deaths, at some point, eventually, people will say, well, this is getting out of hand. We should do something, right? And then they do sufficient reaction. That's the point that they are decreasing RE until RE becomes below one. So RE cannot be above one for a long time. At some point, we will have a behavioral reaction. But what if RE goes very low? If RE goes very low, the cases decline and decline and decline. And at some point, people will say, what is the point of all these social distancing? This is very costly, and I'm tired of that, and I want to go and interact with people. So RE can't go very low either. And if it goes very low, again, people will interact and will increase that above one. So in this feedback loop is resulting in convergence of RE to one without necessarily actually resulting in herd immunity. So it's not because we are and running out of um, susceptible individuals, but because people are adjusting their behaviors based on uh, cases or based on risk perception. So this is the first puzzle. The second is about the waves of the pandemic. Now, it is a good question that why do we have these waves in the disease? Where are they coming from? Why do we have oscillation? Right. If you think about this feedback loop that was introduced here from a system science perspective or from control theory perspective, it is a negative feedback loop. It's a balancing feedback loop. And in that theory, we know that for to have oscillation, you have to have a negative feedback loop with at least two stock variables or two level variables to uh, create oscillation. It is necessary, not sufficient, but you need to have that. So this mechanism is creating and can create oscillation. And we observe that in our simulation too. 
So this is one of the reasons for, to observe waves of the pandemic. Early on, again, you know, if you read the papers during uh, the pandemic, many people were kind of trying to find reasons of oscillations. And usually the hypotheses are around waning immunity, which is correct. Waning immunity can create oscillation, but then not quickly. I mean, it will take to see that pattern and the effect and the, uh, in creating waves. It takes, you know, the, the, the duration of, uh, or the period of oscillation that you would see from waning immunity was not matching the waves that we were seeing from COVID-19, especially early on in the pandemic. Or new variants, they can create oscillations. Seasonal patterns can create oscillation and other behavioral mechanisms. So this was an additional explanation about how you get waves in, in a pandemic. <clears throat> the third one is that you see mortality variants in different countries. Why different countries have different, um, different depth? And that can't be easily explained by many other variables. And but consider that again feedback loop. So the question is that at what level of depth you will be convinced to have stronger measures to control the society? If culturally and if economically we have different uh, thresholds for reaction to number of death, that will result in variation in, um, in the level of death or level of mortality that you see in, in these cases. So my colleague has written a paper on this and they analyze and show that there is a good correlation between how responsive the society or that region is to, uh, to death and number of death that they have. So that better explains the correlation. This four item is the one that I presented today and how it helps enhancing forecasting or the puzzle of why forecasting models are failing. The fifth puzzle was about vaccine prioritization. You may remember that you know, many models kind of argued that um, given the high mortality of elderly, it might be optimal uh, to start vaccination uh, from elderly. And these are coming again from models that don't have this behavioral feedback loop there. So if you expand our idea, our model, to models of different age groups, and have the behavioral feedback there, but consider that different aging groups have different behavioral responses because their risk of dying is different, then suddenly your optimal solution for vaccination changes. So it is not just the fact that younger individuals may have more interactions, but also the fact that their responsiveness to death might be different than um, all elderly because they are less likely to die. I mean, they, ha they have less risk um, in as related to uh, to COVID um, nineteen, and the intuition here is is interesting. Just assume that you have two groups. One is um, less responsive to um, uh, kind of uh, uh, overall risk. One is more responsive. If you are vaccinating the one that is more responsive, right first, then the disease is still spreading and and. The death is decreasing. The ones that are more responsive are high risk. So the death overall will, in, will decrease, which will increase everybody's interaction too. But if you start from vaccinating the ones that are less likely to die, you're actually building the herd immunity. And it's still the ones that are more responsive are have a higher risk perception. So they are taking care of themselves while you're also building herd immunity. And suddenly um, you, you end up with an optimal solution that uh, the society, you know, in general, is is building herd immunity, and the cases are declining. <clears throat> Finally, the the concept of endemic that these days, especially, we are thinking about it. So, what is this endemic? You know, where that can happen? You know, what what is the meaning of endemic? And and if you think again in terms of the feedback loop that was introduced, so it it means that the risks are declining, or our perception of risk. Is, has declined. So it is related to reduced number of cases as everybody is thinking about that. It is related to lower fatality rate, which is about vaccination and about tr and treatment, but it is also about tolerance of risk and how people are and kind of responding to the risks that they see. Or in simple word, endemic is when people say that the risk is not big enough for me to change my behavior and I can go to the normal life. So the risk is when this feedback loop loses its power and that's when we come to the normal life. So 
the implication here is the state of endemic is an epidemiological and disease related construct, but it's also a behavioral construct. So it also relates to how we perceive risks. So it is different for different regions because of how the disease is present, but also it is different because of how people of different, you know, different regions may have different responses, different sensitivities to the risk. So it is also a behavioral construct that you see here. So this is my presentation. Thank you. I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. Navid, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, I had uh, I have several questions here. So um, firstly, clearly SER our models are going to be insufficient because, as you rightly point out, they don't really factor into the behavior of the individual elements that go into the modeling. The thing the one being trying to model is the interaction between the 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 people or you know the the sample subjects, I guess, uh, in, that are being represented in the model. Um, but it doesn't take into account their behavior. And yet, of course, the SERR models in also involve first order partial differential equations or differential equations. I guess they're not partial. They're just ordinarily differential equations. Are some of your modeling, is it, do you feel that it, the, one of the net results of this is that those models should be kind of looked at and revised to be made higher order to take into account higher order differential factors, which might be better reflective of behavior? So that, that's a very good point. It is, it, this is true that SEIRs uh, have limited you know, capacity to, to represent you know, the spread of the disease, especially when human behavior is important, which was the case of COVID-19. So the question is that how you can expand that. So you have a model of disease and you know, the spread of the disease, but there is also human change in human behavior. One approach was that people use the same SEIR, and for human behavior, they feed data, like they get mobility data, then they feed it to the model, changing transmission rate. That's okay for fitting the past data. It is not okay for projecting because you don't know how people will change their mobility. You don't know how people will change their behavior. You don't have data for their future, right? So that's the limitation that they have when you use SEIR and feed behavior as an exogenous variable or as time series, as mobility time series, which is a very common approach these days. <clears throat> Another way to fix and extend SEIR as you were going in that direction is to add a modeling feature to that and model human behavior. So this presentation that I had was a first step, modeling just risk response. So that's a very simple, response that you know human can have the assumption is that death rises i feel higher risk perception and i decrease my activity and if death declines i will increase my activity because i have a uh, lower risk perception that's the simplest one but if i want to kind of build on your ideas there are there are other things that you can add and get more and more complicated models for example covid fatigue or adherence fatigue that means that you know as you decrease your activities you're accumulating this social or psychological construct, which is fatigue, and you get tired, and at some point you may actually say that despite the risk, I can't do this anymore. Or you may say that despite the risk, I, I need to earn money, so I need to work, right? So that also is a behavioral or economic construct that comes in place. So yes, you know, SIR models in their traditional format are not adequate. The focus on just expanding uh, compartments is not helping the focus on including data exogenously to the models is not helping. The way to move forward is to build coupled disease behavior models where you are actually modeling human behavior as a function of different variables in your system. I imagine that those models would become nonlinear and be very interesting mathematically to uh, examine the behavior of. And one of the things which I also was fascinated by with your modeling that you've just presented is that you've included the weather as a potential variable. Um, and 
it was just reminded me of the old joke that lots of people talk about the weather, but nobody's doing anything about it. In your in your case, you're able to go and put the put the weather in as a factor and see whether or not it changes or take the weather out. I'm curious if there are other weather like variables that may affect human behavior that might also be suitable for inclusion in models like this. And I was thinking of like the stock market. If we were all locked down, but the stock market was just going, you know, crazy. And, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Index was, you know, at all time highs, it might affect our individual behavior. I'm curious if you have given any thought to uh, other weather like models that might be important. That, that's a, also a very interesting point. Um, so I, my, my first thought would be that the difference between weather and, and, and uh, stock market is, is the same thing that you said, that we, we, we don't do anything about weather, right? We talk about it. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, even weather is endogenous with all these global warming issues. You know, we, are, we are changing the weather too. But at least in the time horizon of our analysis, weather is exogenous. But stock market economy is getting feedback from the interactions that we have in the society and, and the state of the disease is influencing our economic activity. So a good model will, would be a coupled disease economy model that would mm. include this as a feedback loop in it. That would be that would be very exciting to, to see. Again, that would probably add nonlinearities to the to the system that would mean how you model it would make it very interesting it would make interesting predictions <laughs> that's for sure um but on the other hand it may also be sensitive to initial conditions which is kind of again where there, there could be a lot of science to be uh, explored one of the things which I, I i think that you touched on which i thought was really interesting is the, the topic of uh, mortality variance and just how much mortality one is willing to accept before there's sort of a policy, either a behavioral change at the level of the individual or a policy change at the level of a community or a society. And I'm curious about things that we're seeing now, for example, in China, where there was an initial policy of, you know, zero exposure. We're not going to let anybody, you know, uh, expose anybody else. And now we're seeing sort of the, the knock on effect of that, that they waited so long that now people who, if they go out in the world at all, they're being exposed. And now you're just seeing what's running rampant through that community. Is that something that some of these models might have been able to forecast? So that, that that's a very important point. And again, it is about the complexity of the situation that um, we are dealing with. So on one hand, we know that um, responsiveness to the state of disease is important. If you are more responsive, you can better control the disease, the spread of the disease. But on the other hand, one thing that is underestimated is that you are accumulating adherence fatigue, right? And at some point that fatigue will kind of um, pass its own threshold and then we cannot tolerate it anymore. And you wanna go out, right? We will say, well, this, this is too extreme policy. You wanna go out. And in that state now, the question is that, are we vaccinated enough for dealing with this new condition, you know, very balanced in our NPI and pharmaceutical interventions all together, right? When that thing happens, are we, in vaccine-wise, are we prepared to deal with that? And then with new variants, you know, we all know that all these behavioral reactions decrease the spread of disease by some percentage, right? If you decrease it by like 30% or 40%, and you end up with a mutation that is way more kind of has a much higher or not then the the level of kind of control that we have might not be sufficient for the new variant so there are all these complexities that come and play a role here absolutely Naveed, what are some final thoughts on the role for data science in trying to do forecasting to draw from data to apply it um, to, in this case, epidemiological trends and human behavior, where, what do data scientists need to know in order to be able to utilize tools like this and to, to work in this space? Um, I think there's a, there's a huge value in, in using, um, kind of benefiting from what is emerging. So obviously 
with these new opportunities to have access to huge data sources, you know, those um, COVID models that we use and access that we had to all these and availability of data, these are all important. So I think the role of data science is, is increasing. But personally, you know, as a modeler, I, I like to have these two hand in hand and use data to improve models and use models to have a better sense of what type of data I should look at. So kind of rather than just using care fitting approaches and looking at it as a black box, I like to see it mechanistically. I like to think about uh, rules of nature and like how things are connected and how things evolve and then use that when I'm exploring the questions. So there is a great opportunity to use data, but also we should open our eyes and look at mechanisms and, and, um, and, and the systems in white box way too and see how the logics of the system is working. The other lesson that I learned in this um, paper, and actually the credit goes to my co-author, is that if you expand the regions and expand your sample in different directions, you know, expand the regions, expand the time horizon. So you try to have many, many different conditions in your test. That really helps you to, to be more confident in the results that you're finding. So not being narrow-minded, but kind of expanding it to different regions. And that's now possible because of all these advancements in data science. So you don't have to just take a simple trend and from a country and then look at that or simple you know, time period. You can do your analysis using a very large sample of um, cases, models, regions, and, and kind of be more uh, confident in the results that you're finding or make your results more uh, valid. Navid, thank you so much. This has really been wonderful. Um, a very impressive amount of work. I, I really have enjoyed chatting with you. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's uh, watching on YouTube and who's joined us here uh, on Zoom. And uh, we wish you a very good weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you again, Navid.